Welcome to the Principles to Live By broadcast with our pastor and founder, Dr. Bernard Grant, pastor of Showers of Blessing Christian Center, one of the most loving churches in all the world. And now, let's go into today's life-changing message. We are preparing, I believe, prophetically for seven years of great harvest in this local church. Amen. For those that can believe it now, uh, that's the prophetic word, and, and we are headed for the greatest days of our lives. Tell somebody he's talking about us. He's talking about us. Yeah, God's going to restore everything that the devil has stolen from you. And uh, restore don't mean to replace back with the same. It means to make better. It means to exceed. And God is getting ready to do exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or think. Hallelujah. It is time to get out of that survival mode. And if we would just let God get our minds renewed, God is up to something. Amen. Yeah, yeah. So, so we've been talking about wealth, but don't know it. Wealthy, but don't know it. Wealthy, but don't know it. This is part two of our lesson. We'll conclude it next Sunday. But notice Deuteronomy chapter 8 has been our background scripture. Deuteronomy chapter what? Chapter 8. One verse there in Deuteronomy chapter 8, very familiar verse. And notice, if you would, verse 18. Verse 18. We know God could not be opposed to wealth because he himself said, since the battle, he gives us the power to get it. Look at verse 18. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you what? power to get wealth so that he may establish his covenant which he swore swore to your fathers as it is this day so wealth is not a bad thing say wealth, wealth is not a bad thing, a bad thing. Yeah, the reason we must talk about it is because most Christians in the body of Christ don't have it yet Amen. I know you can pay your bills and that's fine Maybe you can take a vacation. That's good. You can go out to eat on Fridays or Saturday. That's all right. And you got a little nest egg. But very few Christians have wealth. Everybody say wealth. wealth. Yeah, your knees may be getting met. But God wants you. I'm talking about you. I don't care what your socioeconomic status is right now. I'm telling you, I'm going to prove to you from the word of God. And you're going to get your mind renewed to the fact that you're wealthy right now, but unfortunately, many don't know it. Mm. Wealth, somebody said, is the number of days you can survive without physically working and still maintain your standard of living. We understand that the reason God in these last days, saints, is raising up kingdom millionaires. In other words, he's raising up, he's prospering people so that they can put money into the gospel because we need millions of dollars to do what God wants to do in the earth prior to the return of Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, you, you don't have to be a rocket science to realize that we, scientists to realize we are living in the last of the last days. And God has said he's coming back for a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. We're going out in glory now. And part of that to accommodate the harvest, the great harvest of souls that's coming in. This is going to take money to assist this. It's money with a mission. It's riches with a reason. It ain't just about you paying your bills. This thing is a lot bigger than you. And God is up to something. And, and, and I've taught previously that the purpose of covenant wealth is, the, is primarily the expansion of the kingdom of God in the earth. When purpose is unknown. Miles Monroe said abuse is inevitable. And so God is prospering his people. And you got to be, your concern uh, should not be you. It ought to be the kingdom. And when you get your concern on the kingdom of God, you obligate God to prosper your life. I need millions of dollars to do what God has called me to do to fulfill my assignment in this earth with this local church, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and it's got to come through those. Come on now, it's got to come through us. And that's good news. I said, that's good news, that's good news, that's good news. He, he got it, because God's methods are men and women in the earth. He don't rain, he's not a counterfeit, he don't rain money out of heaven. But he works through people. 
And so God wants to prosper you. And I'm telling you, quit the, let him go ahead and do it. It ain't even about, well, I don't need all that. I'm comfortable. I'm all right. It ain't about you. Amen. It's bigger than you. And uh, today's subject now, we're going to look at, and this is the subtopic for the lesson today, the power of covenant relationship. The power of what? Covenant relationship. In regard to our subject, which is wealthy but don't know it, an understanding, and this is what you're going to get today, an understanding of covenant is the platform for getting kingdom wealth. See, we, we got we to gotta fix your finances. But before we can fix your money, we got to fix what's going on in your head. Because if you have an adversity to money, if you're talking about you don't want it, you don't need it, you all right, you comfortable, then money will run away from you. And you want to be able to attract it to you. Amen. Wealth that is covenant wealth, listen to this, it's not an issue of holiness. It's not an issue of holiness and goodness. It's not an issue of education and position. It's not an in, uh, issue of luck or chance. It's not an issue of praying and fasting. It's not an uh, issue of ethnicity, uh, ethnicity, that word there, huh? There you go, there you go. Yeah, that word right there, <laughs> or country. Well, what is the issue then, Pastor? It's an issue of understanding, believing, and practicing. Watch this, blood covenant. Say blood covenant. blood covenant. Now, blood covenant is the oldest and strongest agreement practiced in human history. Blood, blood covenant is the foundation of the Christian faith. It's the foundation of the Christian faith. It is absolutely impossible. Says McGee, impossible means not possible. It's impossible to fully comprehend to wrap your brain around, to fully comprehend and understand and experience the power of the New Testament without understanding blood covenant. God does nothing, and I mean nothing. God does nothing with humanity that is significant or permanent without a covenant. Without a what? Without a covenant. So when we look at this, when we walk, walking in covenant, we're going to see today, will make you prevail on earth against all odds. Now, the statement that I'm going to put on the screen and I want you to write down, and I want them to leave it up there for a moment, and that is, this is the statement that's going to guide this lesson. Every Christian, say every. Every, every Christian is wealthy beyond their wildest dreams not based on personal assets or money in the bank, but based on their blood covenant relationship with Almighty God. If you're taking notes, get that down. That's going to guide the lesson. Just because you don't have it in the bank doesn't mean you don't have it. Every Christian, including you, every Christian is wealthy beyond their wildest dreams not based on personal assets or money in the bank, but based on their blood covenant relationship with Almighty God. I'll say it one more time. Get it now. Every Christian is wealthy beyond their wildest dreams, not based on personal assets or money in the bank, but based on their blood covenant relationship with Almighty God. Look at Mark chapter number 10. Mark chapter number 10. Say blood covenant. blood covenant. Now, the closest thing that we have in our society to blood covenant is marriage. Say marriage. marriage. Now, when we look at this in Mark 10, don't think about your marriage or your mom and dad's marriage, even if it was, even if it was a very good marriage. I want you to think about marriage from the angle of God's intended purpose. Because God originally intended for marriage to be a blood covenant relationship and not a contract, Angela, or, or a living arrangement. Yeah. When we talk about covenant, a covenant is a pledge, a promise, a vow, an oath, 
a commitment or agreement that can only be broken by death. We're going to see today in today's lesson that in blood covenant, two lives become one. All assets, all liabilities, all strengths, debts, weaknesses, and problems are mutually shared among the individuals. The main purpose of covenant is to eliminate weaknesses and produce a stronger whole. Whenever you get married, you really should look for somebody who's strong where you're weak. Amen. Yeah, yeah. Bl blood co the power, tell somebody, the power, the power. Of, a of a covenant relationship. relationship. Yeah, marriage is a picture of covenant. And that's what God intended for it to be. Are you in Mark chapter 10? Follow me closely now. Mark chapter 10, verse 7. Notice verse 7. And I trust I'm not getting the ringing on this now. In this mind. Look at this, verse 7. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his what? Wife. Not, not girlfriend, not woman on the side. His wife. Not his boo, but his wife. His wife can be his boo, but his wife. Okay? And the two shall become what? One flesh. We'll circle that word one. Circle the word one. One flesh. So then they are no longer two, but what? Circle that word one. Stuart, one. That's what I want to emphasize. One. Look at verse nine. Therefore, what God have joined together, let no man separate. Now, in a covenant relationship, Two lives become one in covenant relationship. All they have or possess is available to each other upon demand. One covenant partner, whatever one covenant partner demanded of the other, he must or she must be willing to himself do and even go further. All the assets, all the strength, all the abilities become one. On the other hand, Godfrey, when you get in a covenant with somebody, all the liabilities, all the weaknesses, all the debts, all the problems become one. Amen. What is a blood covenant? In a blood covenant, listen at this, everything is equally or mutually shared or owned by both parties. Anything that is not mutually owned or controlled by both parties, listen to that pastor, I've been doing this over 38 years, will lead to division and problems. Money, because some couples operate their they money, they, they're not together, they ain't together at all. Matter of fact, uh, there's three basic money management uh, options in a relationship, there is yours, mine. That's one. Yours, mine. Then there's yours, mine, ours. And then there's ours. Ours is the will of God. Where one, there's one pot, and the best manager of the pot oversees the pot. And as I so often say, the best manager is not always the man. Amen. Now, when we look at this covenant, because this is going to be vitally important. You've got to understand this now. The power of covenant relationship. Go with me, if you would, to 1 Samuel chapter 18. 1 Samuel chapter 18. And we're going to look at, because in a covenant, terms were negotiated in great detail. In fact, there were primarily five steps to initiating a covenant relationship. And for those that are planning on getting married one day before Jesus comes. You need to understand, you're entering a covenant and not a contract. There, I'm going to show you the distinct, there's a distinct difference. And the problem in most homes is that they got a contract. They don't have a covenant. Oh, Lord. Okay, are y'all in 1 Samuel 18? Put your ribbon or marker there. In 1 Samuel 18. Because in a covenant relationship, covenant relationships are designed to give the advantage, not take the advantage. Amen. 
Now, when we look at covenant, are you in 1 Samuel 18? We're going to see that it, it involves rituals, it involves ceremonies, and it involves exchanges. In 1 Samuel 18, we see at this point in history, biblical history, King Saul is ruling and reigning as king of Israel. He has some sons, and his main son, primary son, is Prince Jonathan. Prince Jonathan is the heir apparent to the throne. Prince Jonathan is the successor. He's next in line. Dad dies. Jonathan will be the king if all goes as planned. At this time in biblical history, David is not king yet. He's just a shepherd boy. And what happens here is so profound because David really had nothing at the time but potential. Yeah. When some of y'all got married, all you had was potential. <laughs> and I, let me just warn some of you sisters and brothers, don't marry potential. I know we have in times past. Yeah, you don't, you don't want just promises. We need some manifestation. We'll get to that in a moment. But watch this. Not just potential. David had potential. He was on his way. He, was, he loved God. And Prince Jonathan and him, they do something. They entered a covenant. Now look what happened in uh, 18 and 1. Now when he had finished speaking to Saul, who was the king. Y'all there? You with me? Yeah. The soul of who? Underline Jonathan, that's the prince, was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Verse 2, Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. So now David goes into the palace, so to speak, to a degree, adopted by King Saul. He don't know how to act. He don't know protocol. He don't know nothing. But he's going to learn from Jonathan. But look what happened in verse 3. Then Jonathan and... This is going to be important in a moment. Follow me. Jonathan and David did something, saints. They made William the what? They made a covenant. Circle covenant. Because, underline because, he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, even his sword and his bow and his belt. The foundation for covenant love is, the, the foundation for covenant, I should say, is love and trust. Love and what? That's the foundation. For any covenant relationship, it has to be love and it has to be trust. Personally now, personally, I would never marry a woman I couldn't trust. Amen. I wouldn't marry somebody Amen. I couldn't trust. Because without trust, you ain't got nothing. I, I don't care. Six-pack like pastor, muscles. Gold chain, Rolls Royce, whatever. I don't care what he got. You ain't got nothing if you ain't got no trust. And if you ain't got no love, uh-oh, uh-oh. And when I talk about love, I ain't talking about, I'm talking about, see, love must be reinforced and strengthened by continued investment of three things, time, energy, and money. Time, energy, and money. Some couples do the right things when they're dating, but after they get married, they neglect each other. Big mistake. Big mistake. And as far as my wife is concerned, I, I, primary, I trust her relationship with God. Amen. Right. Amen. Amen. You don't know what your spouse earns or what's in the bank accounts right now. Look straight ahead. Nobody knows I'm talking about you. Because y'all don't trust one another. Amen. You, don't, you don't trust her. You don't, you don't trust him. And aside from, for, aside from some type of issues, such as uh, addiction, um, all kind of addictions out there, um, you know, you have to have a secret separate bank account or your kids will go hungry if you're dealing with somebody who's an addict. But I'm talking about aside from that, 
there shouldn't be unilateral decisions being made because in the covenant relationship, watch this, the foundation for it is love and trust. And when you value trust, you're not going to do anything to mess with that. Amen. Amen. Now, in a covenant relationship, we see here in the Bible now, a covenant relationship, there were um, rituals and ceremonies. There were five primary steps to entering a covenant, five primary things that you did that you need to be aware of. The first step or exchange was coats and garments. We see, part, we see a part of this is a partial illustration of what happens during a covenant because we see Jonathan is exchanging his, his, his robe and uh, his, his armor, his sword, his bow and his belt, and that kind of thing. An exchange of coats and garments or possessions. When you exchange coats, when you exchange garments in a blood covenant relationship, here's what you're saying. You're saying all that I am all of my resources, all of my possessions is available to you upon demand. When you, when the, the exchange of robes, they were saying all I own, all my possessions, all my belongings are yours and they're available to you at any given time. All I have is yours. All you have is mine. All of my strength, everything I have is yours. That's covenant talk. The second, what's the first step in a covenant? A yeah, exchange of coats or garments. The second step is an exchange of weapons. Everybody say weapons. That's symbolic of all my strength, all my power, all of my ability is now available to you. When you exchange your weapons, you're saying you can trust me. I got your back. You'll fight for me and I'll fight for you. Tell your neighbors and neighbors, we ought to fight for each other, not with each other. In fact, proof someone loves you is if they protect you. Yeah, yeah. Especially uh, in your absence. Oh yeah, oh yeah. When, when, when you're in a covenant relationship with somebody, your enemies are now mine and my enemies are your enemies. That's how I grew up. I grew up in the hood in the inner city of Brooklyn, New York. And we may fight with one another. My first cousins, my, 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 my siblings. But now you can't jump on. Nobody, now I can talk about it. <laughs> but you got, you got to fight all of us. Amen. 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 Then there was an exchange of names. Say names. Names, names. Name says that for, for, forever and a day, you and I will be identified as one forever. Yeah, as one forever. As one forever. When, when, when Shirley Renee Lewis it gets married, let's say, hypothetically speaking, to Brother Washington. Brother Washington saved spirit field rich, love the Lord, and he submitted to his pastor. Amen. <laughs> so when Shirley Renee Lewis marries Brother Washington, she is no longer Shirley Renee Lewis. She is Shirley Renee Washington. And what she's saying is, what they're saying is that forever, as long as we both shall live, we will be identified as one. We're the Washington family. And, and watch this. In a covenant relationship, there is this exchange of names. Say names. 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 Number, number what? Number more. Number four. Y'all with me? There is a shedding of blood. Shedding of blood that, that sealed the covenant. That sealed the covenant. Under the old covenant, it was, they used animals. Under the Abrahamic covenant, it was the circumcision of a man. But well, wasn't that something? With no anesthesia. I was, in, I was in South Africa a couple of years ago, and they still take them young boys uh, 
uh, through a rite of passage and they take them out in the woods and they circumcise them. The ones that's willing. A lot of the, my driver said he wasn't willing. He said he's still in. He just let it be known. That's, he said, because no anesthesia. <laughs> but they look down on you if you don't go on in, in the woods and get, let them old elders of them tribes circumcise you. But back in that day, they didn't have no anesthesia. I mean, uh, all they had was a little sharp stone or rock. My God. Oh, Lord. Okay. But, but watch this. <laughs> Uh, and then under marriage, under marriage, watch this, shedding of blood, under marriage, God intended for two versions, male and female, male and female, marriage is always between a male and a female. Amen. Never a male and a male, Amen. never a woman and a woman. Right. Just because it's legal don't make it right. right. God is right. Amen. But now watch this, two versions would have sex on that honeymoon night and they would put a white sheet, sheet um, up under them and during the sex act the, the, the woman because she was a virgin the blood from the hymen that was broken would flow on that sheet and at that moment in fact they would take them as tokens of her virginity in just case the man tried to falsely accuse and say she wasn't a virgin the parents because you could be stoned if you was the, the parents would pull out the sheet and say yes she was so they kept that sheet, but God would look at that sheet with that blood on it and said, they're now in covenant. They have consummated this marital relationship. In ancient times, they would cut wrists or palms, and then they would shake hands. Yeah, you don't just shake hands with anybody. Uh, you, you, you shake hands with your friends. Yeah, they would cut the wrist or the palms and mix that, mingle that blood together. And man, that, that shaking of hands represented a cut. That's why we shake it. There was a time in America, you didn't need a lot of contracts and lawyers. All you had to do was look a man in the eye and shake his hand and tell him, I'll pay you by Friday. And your word was your bond. Well, the fifth, fifthly, the fifth and final step entering covenant is that cover, a covenant meal was shared together. Covenant meal was shared together. For more information, contact us toll free at 866-724-7495 or you can reach us at Child's of Blessing Christian Center, 1740 East Raleigh Boulevard, Rocky Mount, North Carolina, 27801 or by web at showersofblessing.org and remember, the word works when you work the word.